Okay, so we're welcoming today uh, Jane Backus Johnson, who's going to provide an overview of a recently completed project funded by Health Education England and designed to operationalise the concept of medical <coughs> educational placement. And I think I'm right in saying he's going to focus on the ethical aspects of this concept and ask how and under what circumstances hosting undergraduate students from high resource settings can be a benefit to hosting locations in low resource settings. Yep, that's fair Sounds enough. about right to me. Okay, um, so yeah, just stand up then. Uh, yeah, so I'm James Ackers Johnson, as Kirsty says. I'm from the University of Salford. Uh, so first off, I'll give apologies for Professor Louise Ackers, who was supposed to be here presenting today. She's had to rush off to Uganda on a sort of semi-last minute visit. Um, so I've come to take her place. But I work with Louise on a number of projects anyway. Um, so I know a lot about all the projects that we, we run. Um, second, I'd like to apologise. I've got a bit of a cold slash hay fever today, so I'm going to be a bit sniffly. Um, so if you can't understand me, uh, just, just let me know. Um, I wasn't really sure who I'd be presenting to today, whether it was students, staff, or how many people, or anything like that. So I've done quite a generic um, <coughs> presentation. But I guess if anyone's got any questions throughout, just maybe ask rather than waiting until the end. Um, and do it that way rather than... I think it's, is that better that way, or would you prefer to... <coughs> Yeah, whatever you prefer. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe just yeah, pipe up if you've got any questions then. Um, so yeah, this is a, 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 a project that Louise and I, uh, my colleague Anya Ahmed and Natalie Tate, have been running over the last sort of, 24 months uh, at Salford. It's essentially trying to work out, can, it's mainly healthcare related placements for students be run ethically and sustainably in low resource settings. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about the project, I'm going to tell you about what we've learned as sort of an organisation on how to do this and how to do it right, how to do it ethically, and also um, what the students learn from doing such placements um, in low resource settings. Uh, so I'll start with a little bit about our background. Um, so I work for the University of Salford now. Um, but previously I worked for a charity called the Liverpool Malago Partnership, which was a health partnership between Liverpool Women's Hospital, uh, in Liverpool obviously, and Malago Hospital, which is a huge national referral hospital in the capital city, Kampala, in Uganda. Uh, we used to do a number of projects. Um, we used to do, well, obviously they were all focused on international development and global health, mainly maternal and newborn health. Um, we did a lot of work in scaling up our activity, sharing our knowledge, our experience with other partnerships. And so on the map there, if I've got a pointer, not on the screen is it? On the map there you'll see a number of different locations across Uganda. They're all other health partnerships similar to the one that we worked in, um, but spread across Uganda. And they're all UK Uganda health partnerships, but they were working in relative isolation, working on sort of low sort of shoestring budgets really. Um, pushed along by a couple of highly motivated individuals rather than being efficiently tied together and coordinated. And so one of the projects we did was to bring, bring together all these different partnerships together. We called it the Ugandan Maternal Newborn Hope. It was sort of a consortium of partnerships to share knowledge and experience and skills. And what we all did together uh, was mainly focused on professional volunteering, professional volunteerism. So that was mainly medical staff, nursing staff, midwifery staff, engineering staff from the UK mainly working in the NHS, travelling to Uganda um, for long-term placements ranging between sort of six months to three years in duration. And they were doing a number of activities, a number of uh, areas of focus, looking at capacity building, so um, building the capacity and skills of local staff, um, knowledge exchange, so we fully recognise it's a two-way process. Um, our volunteers go to Uganda, they learn a lot themselves, and they also share their knowledge with the local Ugandan people who they work with. Um, all of our activity from the start, we've had a strong focus on sustainability. Um, we believe that we're not there to firefight, we're not there to plug the holes in the system, we're there to support the system, promote the system itself, um, and help the system strengthen itself, if that makes any sense. And what we found our long-term <coughs> volunteers doing um, for a lot of their time, sort of um, against our um, our plan really was that they were supervising international elective placement students. Now these were mainly medical students 
uh, not from the UK actually, they were from everywhere in the world. They were American medical students, Canadians, Swedish, British, Australians, Chinese, they were from all over the world. And all these students were coming from their countries to Uganda um, on their placements. And it sort of started us thinking, why are these students here? What are they doing? What are they gaining from it? And what is the impact that they're having on the, call it, hosting facilities that they're based in? Um, a lot of them, and again, I'm, I'm referring more to the medical elective side of things here, because medical electives have been going on for years, and this is how it's done. Um, and they are the most common students that you bump into sort of on the ground in health facilities and whatnot. Um, but they were all organised in a very sort of ad hoc manner. Some of them would just literally turn up, they'd book a flight and turn up at a health facility, put on a white coat and walk on to the wards. And we were thinking, is, is that ethical? Is that the right way to do things? Could, they, could students do that in this country, for instance? Obviously the answer is no. Um, and so we saw a lot of um, examples of very bad practice, very badly organised elective placements. Um, students putting themselves at a lot of risk. Uh, as I say, putting on a white coat and being a Western person, even though I've, I've got no medical background, if I put on a white coat in Uganda and I walk into a hospital, they would probably let me open up a patient on an operating table because there's that sort of um, really bad, it's a, it's a, it's a bad sort of um, expectation that everyone from the West is a doctor of some sort or has some sort of skill that they can, they can uh, input into the facilities. Uh, the students would put themselves at risk, putting patients at risk. And they weren't learning a lot, um, and that's, the, that's what we sort of wanted to focus this project on really. How do we actually make the students learn more? And how can we make it so they can contribute the, the skills? And we do recognise that they're only sometimes second, third, fourth year medical students or second year nursing students, but they do have some skills and experiences that they can obviously share with the local people as well. Um, so we wanted to see how we could do this um, more effectively, better, more ethically. Um, and this led us to focusing more on ethical and sustainable elective placements and volunteering. So these are some of the main ethical considerations that we had at the start of the project. I've mentioned a couple already. Um, so I'm going to split them into the UK and in, in Uganda that we, that we thought about before the project. So in the UK, um, the main ethical considerations that we sort of came up with were widening participation. And so as I mentioned before, most of the students who do these sort of placements abroad are medical students. They're from relatively wealthy backgrounds. I'm obviously generalising, but there is a bit of a trend. Um, so medical students from wealthy backgrounds tend to be young students, so students who haven't got family commitments, haven't got um, caring responsibilities and those sorts of things. Um, and they're students who have got relatively high mobility, mobility capital, and so they have the sort of funds to be able to travel around themselves. Um, another ethical consideration we had to bear into, in, in mind was health and safety. So, of course, as you'll all know, uh, if you're sending your students anywhere in the world, you want to know they're safe, you want to know that they're looked after, um, and you want to know they're going to return okay and not come back with any sort of disease or um, illness. Obviously, cost efficiency is a huge thing, so especially our project, it was funded by Health Ed Education England, essentially the NHS, um, and we are accountable to the taxpayers, and so cost efficiency is a huge, huge thing, especially at the moment, given all the cuts and the um, relative uncertainties within the NHS. So we had to you know, take a very strong um, focus on cost efficiency. Obviously, we wanted to maximise student learning, so um, if the students could learn more in the UK, why are we sending them abroad in the first place? Um, is it efficient to send them abroad? Can we make them, can we make, can we achieve different learning outcomes by sending our students abroad than what they can learn by doing a placement in the UK. Um, is it even ethical to outsource our education? I think there's, <coughs> you know, there's, 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 high, there's areas of poverty in the UK, there's areas of um, very multicultural areas, there's high areas of African people living in the UK, um, sometimes first generation who may have only been here a couple of years, so why are we sending our students from the UK to an African country uh, or to India when we have these populations in the UK um, is that ethical? And, and we wanted to bear that into consideration as well. And also the environmental implications. So flying, we, we sent so far we sent about 120 students to Africa and to to Uganda and to India. Um, and obviously that has a, a carbon footprint as well on the environment. So uh, we have to bear that into consideration. Ethical considerations in Uganda and in um, I keep saying Uganda. We did do. I'll come on to India in a second. In a second, but um, I'll focus on Uganda for now. Um, 
the ethical considerations we came up with were sustainability. So is anything that we do, is it going to be sustained? Is it going to be long lasting? Is it positive? Is it mutually beneficial? So we be believe that all development activities should be mutually beneficial. It shouldn't be this donor mentality we're going to go and give. It should be a, a collegial relationship. So we're going to help you to help us. Uh, we're going to help each other. Um, is it ethical to send students to areas that are already very, very limited in resources? And so they have very, very low levels of staff. Um, they are lacking drugs. They're lacking, um, you know, equipment. So is it ethical? for us to send our students to these areas to work with these staff that are already very pushed to their limits. Uh, as I mentioned before, the scale and scope of student activities, and so I put there first do no harm, you'll, you'll probably recognise that from the um, medical oath, the Hippocratic oath that doctors um, sign when they start working for the NHS. Um, if a student finds themselves as being the only person in a, in a small health facility with any sort of medical education, and there's a patient dying there, should they get involved or should they not? What is the scope of their intervention? What are they competent to do? What are they comfortable in doing? And what is going to actually cause more harm than it does good um, in them doing whatever that intervention is? And as I've said before, we've seen plenty of really bad examples of students getting into situations well above their, their heads, working well outside of their competency. Um, because they are assumed to be more qualified than they are or because they think they are more qualified than they are. And sometimes the worst kind of student is the one who thinks they are better than they are um, because they get themselves into all sorts of bother. Um, obviously, there's the ethics of working with children and vulnerable people. Um, things like uh, research ethics, ethical approval. At the start of the project, we got ethical approval in Uganda and in India. Uh, but most projects don't do that, and we have a strong feeling that people should get ethical approval in the, in the country where the activity is actually happening, not just in the UK. Obviously, we had it at Salford as well. Um, but obviously, there's this whole area of research ethics. Is it ethical to go and, you know, look at um, poor people struggling in life and, you know, benefit ourselves from doing research on them in, in some ways? There's obviously cultural differences, and then who knows best? So, if you witness practice which you don't agree with, um, who's right? I mean, we have all the high tech in the UK. We have all this all singing, all dancing equipment. We have highly trained staff, but over in, in, in Uganda in particular, they do have skilled staff, and some of their staff have been working in these conditions for 20, 30 years. Who are we as Westerners to go over with one week's experience of working in an African country and think that we know best, and we know better than the local people who work there? Um, and so we need to be very careful about who, whose knowledge is best and whose is more applicable to the, to the context as well, and that is a low resource context. So this was a project, it was funded by Health Education England, as I mentioned, through the Global Health Exchange, uh, and we ran it in partnership with the University of Salford, which is where I work, and Knowledge for Change, which is a, a charity that we've set up within our research group at the University of Salford. It's essentially, um, we use a charity for our operations, if that makes sense. As you'll know, university finance systems aren't the easiest to navigate, uh, and as we have volunteers um, volunteering on our projects that get paid a stipend, the university weren't happy with setting up employment contracts and things like that. So um, we set up a charity to sort of host um, the, some of the operations, the HR issues, the financial issues as well. Um, but they work in partnership, of course. And our main partners that we worked <coughs> with uh, during the project were Cabaroli uh, District Health Office, uh, Mountains of the Moon University, they're both in Uganda, and MS Ramaya Memorial Hospital, which is in Bangalore in <coughs> India. These are the objectives of the project. So we were, we were funded to pilot and evaluate 80 um, student placements in Uganda and India from the following disciplines, as you can see there. Nursing, midwifery, physio, OT, podiatry. Um, the students came from across the northwest. So we took some from Salford, some from John Moores University, some from UCLan, some from Edgehill, and actually some from Lancaster University. We took four of your um, healthcare management trainees who were working at so Manchester Foundation Trust. Um, on placements as well. So we tried to take students from across the, the northwest. Um, over and above the 80 funded students, um, we also took more of the above. And so many students who either weren't successful in applying for the funding or um, missed the deadlines or, or weren't, um, uh, couldn't apply, they also came to us and asked if they could self-fund for their placements. And we let them do that. So we took some medical students, some biochemistry, microbiology, and business and accountancy students. You'll notice that m medical students weren't actually funded under the remit of the, the main project. And that's because 
it was acknowledged that medical students do do electives anyway, and they have done for many years, whereas these other cadres of, of, of students don't tend to do electives. And so we wanted to look at the students who um, are less likely to do these sort of placements in a, in a usual context. We wanted to test, test logistics and scalability. So how does it work? How do we get the students made to be? What are the risks? What are the um, insurance issues we need to navigate? Uh, and whether that, if we can do it in one area, say in Bangalore in India, if we do it in Fort Porto or in Kampala in Uganda, can that be easily upscaled to Tanzania, to Cambodia, to other places in the world? We needed to identify the core learning outcomes. What do the students learn and how does that compare to a UK placement? Is it Do they learn more? Do they learn different things? Um, what do they take back to the UK with them? Uh, and does, does that knowledge last into the future? Obviously, cost-benefit analysis. So what does it cost to do this sort of project? And how can that be scaled up? Are there any um, economies of scale that can be achieved? We need to obviously assess the impact of the placements on the low resource setting. So are they positive? Are they negative? What can the students contribute? What can we contribute as an organisation to offset any negative um, implications that might, that might occur? Can, we, can it be ethical and can it be sustainable? Um, and then we wanted to propose a model to embed such placements um, within undergraduate curricula uh, to make it part of the mainstream rather than like um, something for the, the minority of people who can afford to do it um, and probably will do it anyway in their lives. This is what we did. Um, we sent four students, sorry, four cohorts of students in the summer of 2015. That was the start of the project. Uh, they all went to Uganda, then we sent one cohort of 19 students to Bangalore in India, and they went to Kaiwara for two weeks as well. And then we spent, uh, the rest of the students were all in uh, 2016. So roughly, in total, around 115 students or so. Um, and we're sending more this year, although the main project's finished, we've sort of rolled this on um, anyway. This is how we evaluated the project. And so we did self-reported uh, learning from the students. They wrote as weekly reports every week. Um, the weekly reports were more to keep an eye on their well-being, check they were happy, check they were healthy and safe, uh, but also to, to see what they've been up to during that week and um, what they hope to uh, do and achieve the following week. We did pre-, mid- and post-placement interviews of all the students, so we interviewed them sort of a few weeks before they went out whilst they were there, and then one month post-return. And that one month is quite crucial, actually, because... We found that students, when they first came back, sometimes they were more focused on the negatives or the positives rather than seeing the overall picture, if that makes sense. And so the students would come back either very frustrated that, I don't know, maybe they, they might have um, been uncomfortable in their accommodation or they might have seen a, a rat or they might have um, you know, witnessed some bad care from a member of staff. And then you speak to them a month later and they've mellowed and they've reflected and they see things completely differently. And we found that really interesting, actually. Um, we found that usually a month was a good amount of time to wait. Uh, we spoke to, obviously, the staff in the hosting facilities and organisations that hosted the students to see uh, what they thought about the placements and what, we, what they thought we could improve upon and how we can, how we can move forward better. We spoke to HGI lecturers here in the UK and programme leaders to see their per perceptions on what students can learn and how that compares to UK placements. Uh, and obviously curriculum managers and policy makers in the UK and HE and, and whatnot. And of course we had our um, staff from Salford go over to Uganda and India and uh, take observations as well. Um, so this is a bit about what we learnt really as an organisation doing this sort of pl um, placement project and how we found we could make it uh, work more efficiently. And it wasn't something that we'd done on this sort of scale before. We had sent students to Uganda before, but we'd not done it on this sort of scale of you know, up to 10 students at one time. Uh, so it's been a massive learning curve for us as placement managers, as well as um, you know, the, stu the students themselves as well. We learned a lot about the application selection processes that need to be followed for these students, and um, they're really, really complex. It's easy to you know, run interviews, and it's important to say actually that the students who went were funded to do this, so most of them didn't pay a penny. Uh, and so there was a lot of interest um, for students to do this. And so we had um, you know, about 500 applications for the 100 places that we had. Um, so we had to run a rigorous application and selection process, not necessarily picking out the best students, because the best students 
might not be the ones that are going to benefit the most from doing this sort of placing. Um, and we wanted to get a good um, a good view of what all students could gain from it, not just the ones who perform the best academically or perform the best in interviews. And so we had to use sort of um, various interview techniques to try and bring out the students that obviously weren't going to cause trouble, weren't going to um, put the project at risk or themselves at risk, but also ones who might not be the strongest but might benefit the most. And of course there's ethical considerations to be taken into account there as well. Um, the students who perform better will probably have more skills that they can share with local staff, um, but also they would potentially not learn as much as well. So how do you balance that when, you stu when you're choosing students? The placement timing was very important. When do students go? Um, as you'll know, curricula across the across the northwest are all very different. With it, we had to balance different years within each cohort, within each subject, within each department, within each university, and trying to organise a time that all these students could travel out in the year was very very difficult. So we had to um, run placements pretty much throughout the year or just satisfy everyone. Um, as I mentioned before, certain uh, students, say those with children, could only travel at certain times of the year and um, that sort of thing as well. Group size is very important. Um, we don't want to swamp the hosting facilities that the students are going to. We don't want to send too many students that they become a burden or that they don't integrate into the local um, health teams or um, organisational staff, staffing groups. And so we had to keep the groups relatively small. Um, ideally we tried to place students in groups of two we didn't really want to take any more than a group of 10 students in total to Uganda or to India at any one time. Uh, we actually took the group of 19 students to Bangalore all at the same time and it was very difficult because from a staffing point of view you've got a lot of students to look after. A lot of these students are from um, slightly more deprived areas of the UK. A lot of them have never travelled outside the UK before, let alone outside of Europe to you know, a low resource country like Uganda, well middle income country India or a low income country like Uganda. And so um, they all have their own needs, they all have their own uh, desires and wants. Uh, and of course, it's, it's hard to say without sounding slightly um, sexist, but these professions tend to be dominated by women. And some of the, you know, the most important learning that I've had is how to deal with a group of very young 18, 19 year old female students. Because if you put 10 of them in a house together, they do fall out and the group fractures and it causes all sorts of negativities amongst the group and then that's, that flows into the placements as well and so that's something that I really learned how to manage groups of um, largely young, young females. Um, the ability and level of study, I've mentioned that already, do you take the best students, do you take uh, students who have done, completed three years of studying or after the first year and that balances you know, how much they've got to contribute and how much they can learn from doing such a placement. Um, placement plans and timetabling, so students they love to experience as much as possible, as many different placement sites. We work in, with loads of partner organisations ranging from big hospitals to small health centres to um, the prison system, the um, small sort of community based organisations which look at women's empowerment and mental health. Um, so we've got all these different partners in all the different placement locations. Students like to jump around and experience as much as they can of all of them. Um, and that's understandable, you want to see as much as you can. But at the same time, that does reduce learning outcomes. So if you spend a day in each location, you're not integrating into the team, you're not learning about how the system works. Although you might think you know after one day, you really don't know. And I can say for certain, after working in, in Uganda for eight years, I'm still learning a hell of a lot about how things work over there. So um, to spend just one or two days in one location really doesn't mean that you learn about that location. And also it takes time to build up trust with local partners and trust is really, really important. Relationships are absolutely crucial when working in, uh, in, in Africa and in, in, in India as well. Um, so we try to restrict the students to maybe if they go out for a four week placement, we try to restrict them to maybe two different placement locations, maybe a big hospital and then a smaller um, community based organisation to give them uh, a good experience but also a learning experience. Not a, we want to get away from this perception of um, volunteerism, sort of gap year um, sort of placements, because we are an educational placement provider, we're not a holiday company. Um, so we want to get away from that perception of um, people, and not just, not just students, volunteers as well, um, coming, turning up one day, going on safari the next day, turning up for a morning the next day, disappearing to the beach or to, um, on safari or something. I mean, it's, we want to get away from that, we want to do this properly.
Um, and we found out obviously pre-placement induction was absolutely crucial for all the reasons that I've already mentioned. I'll come on to that more now. Um, expectation management was something that we quickly realised we had to be um, very careful of. Um, so students wanted to jump around from one location to the other. We had to let them know what we expected of them. So we expected them to work eight hour days. We expected them to work hard. We expected them to, be, to, to turn up on time. They had to be there at nine and they had to leave at five. Um, they got an hour for lunch as well. Um, we had a code of conduct. So if they didn't turn up on time, they got, they got disciplined. And that would be fed back to <coughs> um, HEIs here in the UK as well. Um, expect, expectation management of what these students can expect of us in terms of what support we will give them, but also what we won't give them. And that's really important. Little things, um, or what we consider to be little things, like Wi-Fi. Um, we told the students they would have Wi-Fi when they got to, especially in um, Uganda, the Wi-Fi was off and off if there was a power cut or it was slow. And that really made them complain. And again, that fed into their placements. It's the small things that make massive differences. Um, Logistical arrangements, so we had to make sure that the students know, knew who was going to pick them up at the airport, and that's really important, especially if it's a country you've not been to before. Um, and it was important for us, especially me and my colleagues, we travel to Uganda all the time, and we see these things as being small things, you know, being greeted by a big group of taxi drivers shouting, you know, I'll take you to the next town. And we, we sort of take that with a bit of a laugh, whereas, you know, if you've never been to a country like Uganda or India before, those sort of things can be a massive fa facing for the students. Um, and so we made sure that they knew exactly who was going to pick them up, exactly what they needed to do, exactly how the visa process worked, what flights they were getting, how long the transfers were, how long the drive was to the location, um, and how they would get to their placements each day. So if they were close to their placements, they had to walk. If they weren't close, we'd give them a, um, a lift. Um, during the induction, we also did a lot of team building and networking. So all the students who were going to travel out together, and bear in mind these students were all from multidisciplinary groups um, they all, all study different things and they all went to different universities a lot of the time we might have a group of six or seven students traveling out who never met each other before and so it was great for them to get into a group set up a facebook group or a whatsapp group get in, get in um, contact with each other before they travel out um, and they fed back to us that they, they much appreciated traveling out as a group rather than arriving individually and then making a group out of it um, and they found that really beneficial um, they were able to give each other advice um, you know, what to pack, what to what tourist activities are worth to do on the weekends. Um, and other general information about um, <coughs> where the shops are, how the currency works, what to wear, some um, cultural sensitivities, what to um, expect when you go out, go out there, about health and safety, risk, insurance, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, we gave them an induction pack, we gave them a guide to the local area. And we gave them placement agreements which contained their sort of schedules, their working hours, um, potential disciplinary proceedings if they, if they failed to um, turn up on time or if they engaged in any activities that weren't just to be um, you know, acceptable during their placement. Endurance and risk mitigation is obviously a huge, huge area when you're sending students to um, anywhere in the world, especially to low-income countries, which can be quite um, dangerous if you're not careful. We were lucky, really, that um, Bangalore is one of the nicer cities in India, one of the safer cities, as is Fort Portal in Uganda. So we did choose um, areas to send the students to that we knew were already relatively safe. And we did have a full risk assessment done of all the placement locations. Um, and it covered everything from the moment the students or a volunteer arrives in the country to when they arrive at their accommodation and then the transport and logistics um, throughout, that, throughout their placement as well. Um, we did ask students to uh, disclose any uh, personal and medical uh, health or um, welfare issues, well-being issues. Again, that was really important, and I, again, it's a, it's a big learning for me. I didn't realise just how many students did have um, mental health issues or physical disabilities, uh, and it wasn't in any way to try and uh, dissuade them from coming or to, um, you know, um, discriminate against them. It was just so we could make sure that we had the systems in place when they arrived to support them. Um, all sorts of you know wild and wonderful medical conditions came through to us, and obviously we passed it on to our insurance to check that they were insurable. Um, we also passed it to our medical staff who we had on the ground um, in, in the placement locations, local and UK staff. Um, as I say, there were many, many students who had medical um, conditions, and there was only one student that we actually didn't uh, end up allowing to travel to Uganda because she had a, a relatively complex heart condition. 
um, and her consultant had already actually signed her off to travel. Uh, but our doctor, who was based in, in Uganda at the time, said, look, if anything goes wrong, we can't possibly do anything for her. It's just too risky. Um, and she was a relatively junior doctor, but she stuck to her guns, and we had to obviously back her in, in the circumstances because she knew the context better than her consultant in the UK did. Um, so there was only one student out of all of them, and there were many <coughs> one patients, and we were able to uh, support all of them. Um, comprehensive travel insurance is really important, so the University of Salford allowed us to cover all the students regardless of their HEI uh, under our one insurance policy and that's important because then you have one, insurance, one emergency number, one contact and you know that the policy was strong and that it covered everything. Um, a lot of the sort of gap year um, travel insurance doesn't cover placements uh, sufficiently. Um, so we had to make sure that we had a good policy and the Salford one worked fine for us. Um, I mentioned already, secure pre-arranged travel arrangements were really important because the highest cause of morbidity and mortality across Africa and across Asia are road traffic accidents and so we had to make sure that we had a good, strong, trustworthy vehicle and a trustworthy driver to pick these students up every day and take them to placement, pick them up at the airport uh, and we had to trust them to drive safely and make sure the students got made to be safe. Local orientation was important. As soon as they arrive in their placement location they're shown around, they're shown where the shops are, where the banks are, where they can change money, where they can go for a drink safely. Um, all that stuff and that meant a lot to the students. Again, many of them haven't travelled to Africa or India before and so it was a bit of a facing for them. And we gave each student an emergency phone um, just in case they got lost or just in case they needed to contact each other or contact, contact our placement management team. Um, they had a, a local phone there that they were able to use. Um, really importantly, and this actually turned out to be the, by far the most important uh, aspect of, sort of insurance risk mitigation was the supervision that we provided for the students. I'll come on to that more now. So the students had access to obviously our team in the UK but the majority of the time we were based in the UK although I did travel out with a few groups and my colleagues did as well. Um, they had access to placement managers in the placement locations in India and Uganda so we had a, a, a local placement managers who were there to um, help them if they were feeling ill or if they needed to up or if they needed some advice or support with they had a good structure there to support them. They had a good clinical supervision from the local staff, so local doctors, midwives, nurses were able to support them well, uh, and they had obviously the support of their, their group that they were travelling with. And that's really important because um, some of the students did witness quite traumatic um, ex experiences, especially sort of children's nurses, um, some of the social work students they were dealing with sort of end of the line cases, working in sort of neonatal intensive care units and they did witness some bad care provided by local staff or what they considered to be bad care um, and it did emotionally, uh, some of them were slightly, slightly distraught by it and so having that group of people there to support them after witnessing something negative was really important. By far the most important supervision and the most important um, part that we played as, a, as an organisation was providing UK professionals call them anchoring volunteers and I'll explain why. <clears throat> so each group of students who went out, they were supported by a long-term volunteer. Um, that's working on on the back of our previous projects that we've run. We've always had long-term volunteers in, in Uganda in particular over the last eight years and we continue to do so. These volunteers are all medical, nursing, midwifery, social work, engineering. And so they've got a good background, they've got a good knowledge of the local context and how things work. Um, and they were able to provide really, really close, strong supervision for the students whilst they were on placement. Um, not only that, but the reason I've called them anchoring volunteers was because in order to make any project sustainable it has to be long-term aimed, long-term oriented. Uh, so having a volunteer there for six plus months meant that we could start a project, a student could arrive, engage with the project, get sort of stuck straight in at the deep end um, and not have to worry about making new relationships as such because we had the relationships there ongoing all the time. Um, and they were able to contribute to that project, so they were able to link in, anchor onto the, onto the, the volunteer, um, stay the duration, most of the students did four week placements, travel back to the UK and that, that project was still ongoing uh, after they left and the next group of students could then pick that up when they arrived. And we found that was really important for sustainability and also for our impact on, on Uganda and in India as well. Um, it was really important to have that sort of ongoing relationship, ongoing presence um, on the ground at all times. Um, the other reason why it's good to have the UK professionals there is because of risk. Um, the local staff, they are 
under-resourced and so there's a lack of staff but also the staff who are there or who are supposed to be there are often not there uh, so there's very high levels of abs absenteeism especially in Uganda very high levels of sort of dual working moonlighting many of the doctors in particular are never ever there uh, on the wards midwives do tend to be there but sometimes when they see a, a western person turn up they do find an excuse, find an excuse to disappear and so the volunteers that we had there were able to support that to provide that sort of uh, safety net just in case a student was left in a situation that they couldn't deal with, they weren't competent to deal with, our volunteers were there to be able to support them and support the patient in that situation. Co-presence principle, that's a principle that we've followed over the last eight years of working in Uganda. Um, we say that our volunteers, and that's professional and student, are not allowed to work alone, they're not allowed to be left on their own with a patient. Um, even if they're you know, a consultant obstetrician, they're not allowed to be left with a mother in Uganda. And that's for three reasons. One, risk, if anything happens. The risk of litigation in Uganda is low, but um, it's still there. And so you need someone there to provide an extra pair of eyes and some, some support in that sort of situation. Learning. If there's no one there to work with, you don't learn anything. Um, you don't exchange skills. You don't exchange knowledge and experiences. Um, and also, it's just more enjoyable, we find. A lot of volunteers, uh, mainly the doctors, were happy to work alone, but then they didn't really integrate into the local teams. The local staff sometimes started taking advantage of them, putting them on rotors uh, to give them an, an excuse to go and work in their private practices elsewhere. And so, um, for the well-being of the students and the volunteers, it's always good to be working with a local person. As well. uh, regular professional and personal debriefing is really important. Every Friday afternoon, we ran debriefing sessions for the students to go over anything traumatic or distressing they'd seen, anything that might have upset them or anything that they wanted to um, look into the following week. And we would try to be as flexible as possible in um, changing the placements as much as we could. This is what we found that the students learned, and I'll, I'll, I'll breeze through this quite quickly, there's a couple of slides on it. But essentially, the, the students use all these buzzwords, as you can imagine. Uh, they describe the placements as being transformational, motivational, reinvigorating, eye-opening. I mean, these, um, for instance, nursing students, they've only been working in sort of the, the NHS for a year or so, and they were already quite um, tired of it, ground down by it. And so they did actually find it quite um, reinvigorating to go and work in a, a low-resource setting. They describe themselves as being better students, better healthcare professionals, um, more confident and reduced fears in dealing with um, situations that they might not be used to. Um, one of the key findings was a greater appreciation of health, health systems in the UK, so an appreciation of the NHS and actually how good it is, rather than all the, the sticky gets in the media. Um, and they reported uh, clinical skill gains and confidence in using existing skills as well. Um, soft and transferable skills, so cultural awareness, learning about how different cultures work, and as I, as I say, there's very multicultural areas in the UK, and so learning to deal with different cultures and how people behave is, is really important. Um, management, team working, uh, entrenchment of the UK's core, uh, NHS's core values, care, compassion and the importance of it. So that's not just learning from good practice, it's actually often learning from bad practice. Um, there are relatively low, low level, I'll hesitate saying this, low levels of compassion um, shown by staff in Uganda towards the patients and that's sometimes for cultural reasons, sometimes because they're rushed and they have very busy schedules um, but the students really gained an, uh, an appreciation of how important it is to talk to patients and go through them about what they're experiencing and how they're feeling. Um, the importance of timekeeping and patience, again from the lack of um, timekeeping and patience, you can arrange a meeting in Uganda and for, for 10 and people turn up at 1 and that really drills home the need to turn up on time to meetings in the UK. Um, the importance of more mundane tasks that people take for granted here, data collection, audit, people, things, tasks that, that people tend to shirk away from and really don't understand the benefits of. When you're thrown into a system that um, has a complete lack of or a very minimalist approach to uh, data, data collection and audit, you really do uh, learn to see the value of, of it and the, the importance of it. Uh, and holistic system, system thinking, so seeing the system as a whole rather than just seeing it as, as a child nurse or as a physiotherapist, seeing the whole health system as one and seeing your position in it. And we find that's a big difference between the, um, the placements in the low-income countries and in the UK. In the UK, uh, and it's in universities and also in placements in, in hospitals, the students are very boxed. So you are a child nurse, you just work in this unit, or you are a, a physio, you just work on this unit. 
what they see in Uganda is because a lot of the system is sort of failing or it is weak, they see the whole system and they see that if this patient gets referred from the physiotherapy unit here to the main ward here, they see the impact of that. And that really, really gains them an appreciation of the whole system. Um, spoken in exposures, we found it really interesting that, um, say, child nurses in the UK never witness a birth of a child, even though they're the ones who deal with the complications resulting from um, that birth if it goes wrong. And so during the placements, we were able to give the students exposure to things that fell just outside of their remit. Um, another example would be, uh, say, prosthetics and orthotics students. They got to go into biomedical engineering labs and they could see how the, um, the technology that they use on a day-to-day -day basis was made. And that really gave them an appreciation of knowing how to use it, if that makes sense. Um, <coughs> students often observed um, cases of uh, patients presenting hospitals with uh, conditions that might not fall quite within their speciality. Um, so I'm trying to think of an example. Something like um, delayed so, so ruptured uterus in, in childbirth. They might not always see that in the UK, whereas in, in, in Uganda and in India they did see that. Um, the students also learned a lot from each other. So it was interesting having a, a multilateral, a, a, a multidisciplinary group of students out there because I never really understood what a podiatrist did, and a lot of the students didn't. But then having spent time with a podiatrist on the ground, they actually gained appreciation of what each other did and their roles and how they linked together as well. Um, gains in skills, so dealing with things they're not used to, malaria, TB, HIV, nutri nutritional deficiencies, um, lack of preventative care, so uterus, diabetic foot ulcers, contextual differences, so there's a lot far higher instances of burns and sepsis uh, in Uganda because they cook on uh, fire. There's a lot of children coming with burns, different drug and treatment plans, and the students also, also gain teaching and presentational skills because um, we linked them up with the local university, Mount of the Moon University, and they were able to go and do presentations with the students and work with them on that as well. Finally, career benefits. Um, a lot of the students reported back to us that they felt more sure or more certain that nursing or OT or whatever it was that they were doing was the right career for them, or, or vice versa. Um, some of them actually said, I, I'm training as a nurse and I want to train as a midwife, and so they went and retrained as a midwife. Um, I think undoubtedly it is CV building. There's this sort of mobility, mobility imperative, as we call it, um, in Telford. I don't call that here. Um, so people are always trying to build their CVs. There's this growing emphasis on travel and seeing um, different areas of the world. Um, it gave them interview strength, so more confidence, because we did interviews as well. And a lot of the, the students that we interviewed hadn't really been interviewed before. Um, so we gave them interview strength and obviously internationalization experience. And then the fun stuff, as, as I call it in the slide, I don't know why I call it fun stuff. Um, seeing new things, doing new things, um, witnessing new uh, cultures, new lives, um, new settings, going on safaris. As I say, a lot of these students are from poorer backgrounds and they wouldn't ever have been able to do this sort of, have this sort of experience without receiving the funding that they received. And I'm sure it'll stick with them for, you know, for their lives. Um, we did a survey of all the students, so... Um, we asked them all to, to rank their learning um, based on what they fed back to us uh, during the interviews. And this is what they fed back. So compared to the compared to a UK placement, what impact did your placement have on you um, in Uganda and India? And as you can see, the impact was stronger than a UK placement in most of those areas. Um, the highest areas, unsurprisingly, really, are resource awareness, so learning from working in a resource poor uh, scenario. Appreciation of the NHS, cultural awareness, they all scored quite highly. Um, slightly less skill and competence and slightly less patience and timekeeping, teaching and presentational skills. But by and large, um, the students themselves found that or thought that their placements had a higher impact on their learning than UK, UK placements would do. Um, most of the students, 90, well, yeah, 90 odd percent, thought that the learning they achieved was similar to what they learned in their courses here, so it was along the same lines as what they learned in the UK. Um, and then very positively, um, students very positively believed that their placements had a, a strong impact on their career uh, and employability. Um, that's 100% thought it was positive. 
I guess we could only really get a true gauge of that if we tracked them into the future and did sort of a longitudinal uh, analysis of what jobs they're going to. Um, this is very subjective. I mean, the students were only there for four weeks, but by and large, they all felt that they'd had a, a, a strong impact on the hosting facility. Um, I guess they aren't the best judges of that. The best judges of that are the, the local people working in those um, facilities. But by and large, the students felt that they had a positive impact. And I guess that's a good thing. At least they go home feeling good about themselves. Um, and by and large, they had an excellent placement experience, which I was very happy about. It was something, as I say, we hadn't done before. Um, but given that we, we started from um, not really knowing what we were doing, I think over the course of the project we learned a lot and by the end all the students really enjoyed their placements. <coughs> the costs. Um, so we worked out that over the course of the project um, each placement costed roughly uh, £1,900 uh, for a four week placement. That includes all the flights, accommodation, the airport transfers, uh, taking them to and from their placements. It included the UK staffing element and obviously the Ugandan staffing element as well. It included costings for our long-term volunteers, the phones that they received and also um, of each student that went we contributed roughly 150, more likely 200 pounds into the local health system. Um, not in cash, we didn't do cash donations or cash uh, payments, we did sort of in-kind payments because we wanted to avoid the whole corruption and um, sort of donor mentality sort of thing. So we spoke to the we spoke to the staff who hosted the students and said, you know, what would you really need? What do you appreciate? If they said, you know, we'd like this room decorating, we'd, we'd decorate the room for them. Or if they said we really need this piece of equipment, we'd buy the equipment for them. That was part of our, eth our ethical commitment as well, along with the long-term volunteers that we provided for them. Um, the 1,900 also includes, um, I guess, what I would call additional staff time, uh, so for our, our evaluation time, which wouldn't be required moving forward, you'd argue anyway. And so it covered sort of my, my travel costs to go over and supervise the students. I'm not needed there anymore. We've got our staff on the ground there anyway, so um, it would be lower. At the moment, we have placements costed at just short of £1,500 uh, for four-week placements for students. So it's, in reality, it's somewhat less than that. And there are economies of scale as well, so I think we could probably re reduce the costs if we achieve some good economies of scale to roughly £1,300 per student for four weeks. With the cost of barrier, well, that was hard to tell for the students because most of them had the placements fully funded. So obviously the costs weren't a barrier. The only costs that the student faced were the, um, the lack of ability to work whilst they were away, if that makes sense. So, um, they weren't able to do bank shifts and whatnot. Towards the end of the project, we did implement a contributionary element. So each of the students had to contribute around uh, 400, 500 pounds. Um, towards the cost. We wanted to see whether that would put off students from doing a placement, how they felt about making a contribution and also we found that um, students who made a contribution valued the experience more. They weren't just there for the holiday, they were there because they actually wanted to be there and it was something they really wanted to do. And even what we considered to be a relatively small contribution of 395 did put off some students who just wanted to go for a free holiday essentially. Um, <coughs> of the students who we didn't fund ourselves, over 70% of them did find funding elsewhere from their own universities or from looking online or doing um, fundraising campaigns. So most of them told us, reported back to us, that they didn't actually pay for their placements. They found external funding for it. Uh, I expect the other 30% probably went to bank of mum and dad, uh, but they may have done fundraising as well and not told us about it. The medical students tended to have um, a far greater ability to draw on personal and family resources. Um, Self-funded medical students, literally, they'd come to us, they'd express an interest, we'd interview them, and straight away they'd pay the money over. The other students struggled a bit more, um, especially the ones from sort of low-income backgrounds. Um, a small but significant amount of students said they wouldn't be able to afford it, uh, the £400 contribution, that is, unless they had plenty of notice. And so it's important for the students to have as much notice as possible. If they're going to do any sort of fundraising to help them support the cost, they need a lot of um, notice to help them do that. And that's the end, that's a video, but I won't show that now anyway it's on the website uh, to summarize um, i won't summarize because you've been listening to my voice long enough i'm sure you're bored of, <laughs> I'm sure you're bored of my voice now um we've recently published three three paul gray books uh, they're all open access so if you're interested in <coughs> um the first book looks more at uh, professional volunteerism so what impact can professional volunteers have 
on developing countries based on our experience over the last eight years in Uganda. Um, what can doctors, midwives, nurses who we place there on long-term placements give? Uh, what, what do the local people think about that? The second book looks more at the placements, which is what I'm talking about now. Um, looking at what students learn, what the ethical considerations are, uh, what our colleagues in Uganda and India have referred back to us about their experiences of working with students, and how we uh, it essentially contains the model that we propose that other people use uh, in order to make these placements ethical. The third one is looking at, again, more professional volunteers, but what do the volunteers themselves gain and what is the impact on the NHS? What can the NHS gain from um, NHS staff doing long-term placements abroad? Um, and then there's two papers at the bottom as well. Again, they're looking more at professional volunteers. Thank you. That was the... Yeah, thank you, Jen. The Great, thanks. So, so the, um, the funded project's finished, yeah. yeah. The last group of students we took out were the Lancaster um, NHS graduate management students who went out in October last year. Okay. Um, and yeah, we've just finished writing up the book. Literally, it was published about two weeks ago. So. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, as far as we see it, that HE program's finished. But um, <coughs> we still run self-funded placements for students um, through Knowledge for Change. I guess we've <laughs> we spent a lot of, well, the last two years really getting a system in place, so it seemed a shame to let it go to, yeah, yeah. Go to waste. So um, yeah, we've got a good system in place now. Also, Salford send us quite a few, quite a few students. There's a big demand for these these placements, yeah, and we'd yeah. rather it was done right than done wrong, really. So, um, we're keen to support as many students as possible. So before it. you were offering these with students, sorry, I'm just asking. <laughs> uh, these are just some follow-up. Um, with students sort of seeking them out through charitable or well, just these all yeah. from tourism. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, I mean, there's loads of organisations that do it. A lot of them are based in the countries themselves, um, but they are often slightly dodgy because they'll say they say they'll, you know, do everything under the sun for the students, but they turn up and there's no one to pick them up and there's no one to look after them when they're there. They're just dumped somewhere. Um, so you have to be very careful. Um, but also some of the, the UK ones can be a bit shaky as well, and elsewhere in the world. So there's loads of organisations offering placements, but. A lot of them don't offer offer them in the way that we'd like them to <laughs> to offer them. <coughs> yes, I suppose I was um, I was left thinking about that question about is it ethical? You know, when you've got areas of sort of low incomes in the UK or where the NHS is really stretched or where there are services that, are, you know, where we've got our own problems basically with that kind of view. Is it ethical? You sort of asked that, I don't know whether you've got an answer to that. Is it ethical for students to do overseas placements in what you call low resource, is it low resource? Yeah, low resource, yeah, low resource settings. Or is it part of sort of credentialisation of UK students, I suppose? I think it can, it can be ethical if it's done right. And so if you have an organisation that has ongoing projects, um, a lot of our projects were funded by the Department of International Development from, by UK Aid. And so they, they run anyway. We've got them running anyway. Um, and so if we link students into those projects, we think it can be ethical and it can, the students can have a positive benefit on the local, I keep saying recipient, on the, on the hosting country. Um, in the UK, in terms of um, widening participation, that sometimes lies directly in cost efficiency, as, as, you'll, as you'll know. Um, and so if, for instance, a, a, a blind student uh, wanted to do a placement, could we then justify the NHS paying for a... a um, translator uh, to travel out as well and then it starts it does start to become very very expensive then and so it's difficult <laughs> to say whether in, in the UK it can be ethical or not uh, but that's mainly because of the conflict between cost efficiency and 
widely participation. I was just thinking you're talking outright in my head. I mean, it's just, is it is it true that there are more that, that middle classes students are more likely to go into uh, medicine than into nursing? So is that, is that mm -hmm. part? Yeah. It's all part of the most <coughs> yeah, it's part of a, a much much bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Medical students do tend, to, again, it's massively generalising, but by and large, compared to the nursing students, particularly in the northwest, they do come from better off backgrounds. Uh, and there's a culture in medicine that students will do an elective and every student when they sign up to do medicine they expect to do an elective. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them do do it in the UK but most of them travel to low income countries. It's something like 70 odd percent of them travel to low income countries. Some go to Australia, America, New Zealand. Um, but there's that whole sort of med medical culture that you will go to a, a, a low income country and you will treat patients. Um, and we really like to, to conflict that really. I don't think it's a student's place to go into a low income country and provide their incomplete skill set uh, to patients. Um, nursing and midwifery students do do elective placements, and uh, physios and OTs, uh, AHE, AHP students do do elective placements uh, in the UK. It's harder for them to get it recognised within curricula than it is for medical students. So the medical students elective is recognised, all they have to do is sign off some very simple competencies and that's done, it's recognised. Um, we're now able to get physio and OT placements signed off within curricula now because we have a UK physio and OT based in, U in Uganda and so they're able to sign off competencies. Um, and some of the nursing students are now able to sign off, not just ours but also spokes uh, because we have nursing volunteers there as well. So we're, we're finding ways to enable students to make this part of the mainstream rather than just something that only medical students do. The only sort of nursing would refer or AHP students that would do this usually would be the very wealthy ones and do it as a holiday rather than as a placement. In Australia it's necessary, we have to do it and we have to do it in a rural, we have to do it in a rural environment but rural can mean, rural's a bit different here but we, we have, we, it's, it's part of the curriculum and the reason and you cannot, this is what, leading on to my question, is preparation for worst case scenarios and, and action to trauma um, trauma and being able to respond quickly with limited resources and getting into hospital because you know by nature these, these environments aren't like you know the UCLH place where you have a, a corridor full of drugs and, and basically as many swabs as you damn well need. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it, it's, it's totally different and it's completely essential and the reason linked to the learning outcomes is prepare us for um, for traumatic, fast-paced environments, which is our problem. And also about developing our bedside manner, um, because you have to, because you become part of the community. I mean, here you were telling me at the beginning, you know, anyone from a foreigner can go in and they immediately think of a doctor and they can put you with a scalpel in your hand. Um, and that's because their, their, their culture around medical care is far more long-term, um, community based where here it's still very much an acute care meaning that you have a problem you go and see a doctor the doctor gives you something and that's the end of it there it's what we call um, a little bit of longer term where your long-term health is monitored because it's part of the community and they can respond to it. it's a different way of operating arguably it's better to do that here but if Fantastic work, but the more important thing is that, of course, as you rightly pointed out, medical students do always have to go for an elective. But the, the reason why they choose that for a different country, I was literally eager to see what's the difference between the Ms. Ramaya college that you did in India and Uganda, because Ms. Ramaya is quite a developed hospital. It will no longer provide the circumstances that you have in Uganda in that sense. But more importantly, the electives are usually done by medical students because they want to get more experience into that. So, for example, if you are attending a labor case here, the number of ones you can put a hands on will be so much limited. Yeah. If you can do it under observations in India or in other places. 
But the result that you showed here was that the students' expectations for skills and competencies was much lesser and having an impact. And that's the most important part of literally doing an overseas elective. That you do get to see a lot of variety of cases and expectedly your skills and competencies will improve in that sense. That's one of the reasons why so many self-funded students do get to do the electives in developing countries. One of the things is that you get to see a wide variety of cases, but also to get the experience in many cases that you don't be able to do that in some of these areas. So what, what should the students <coughs> the four weeks that is very, very short in mm -hmm. that sense to get really the skills and competencies that range develop. Have you had any measurements onto that? It's an, it's an interesting question. Um, to give a bit of background, so as I said, we, we've worked in Uganda for the last eight or so years, so we've got very good relationships, we've got an ongoing project, we've got long-term goals and, and, and um, sort of objectives. Um, we were asked to include India as a sort of uh, a project, but we had no, no background there. We had no knowledge of how the place worked. I'd never been to India before this project. And so we didn't have the system in place, we didn't have the structure, we didn't have the long-term volunteers there, we didn't have the relationships there. And so what we had to do for India was just approach randomly MS Ramaya Hospital, because we knew it was quite a good hospital, um, and say, would you be able to supervise our students? And they had a very, very different experience, the students who went to India. Um, the Indian staff were much more organised. They, I mean, I went to India with the students, but they had a very you know, organised placement schedule. It was all laid out for them. The staff were there to support them. They had a buddy um, from the local uni uh, Indian university who worked with them. Um, and so and the other thing was it was a lot more expensive for us. And so essentially, the India side, it wasn't so much development as is our background. It was more transactive. They charged us for a placement. We gave them the students. They ran this, the, the placement as a placement. Um, whereas Uganda, we had to do a lot of the, the groundwork. We had to find our own accommodation. We had to organised placement schedules uh, in negotiation with our colleagues. The second thing about India was that the, um, the placements were observational only. Now I think that that had a direct effect on the skills and competencies. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I did look at the difference between the st um, what the students fed back to us who went to India and the ones who went to Uganda. And the ones who went to Uganda did find that they gained more skills and competencies because they were able to do hands-on work under the supervision of our long-term volunteers and our close relationships that we have in Uganda, they were able to treat patients. And some of the sort of most critical feedback that we had was from the India placements because the students said this felt like flies on the wall. They stood there and they watched. And although they had some skills, they wanted to change the beds, they wanted to do basic observations of the patients, but they weren't allowed to. So they just had to stand and watch. And they said that they felt that they didn't learn as much being flies on the wall as they would have done if they could actually get closer and I mean because we had long term volunteers in, in Uganda the, the midwives were right you know delivering babies with our volunteers they were going into theatre and seeing how these procedures were done and getting shown you know from you know, less than a foot away um, but that didn't that doesn't happen when it's observation only and I think that has a big big impact yeah massive impact but then of course there's the whole insurance and risk issues that you have to be very careful allowing students to uh, engage in hands-on work, which is why most gap year companies and elective placement companies don't let them. That was one of the main things that we found. Hands-on placements were led to far greater learning outcomes than observation only. Um, and also the students felt a lot happier, feeling, felt, they felt like they were contributing more by being hands-on. Um, but yeah, we weren't allowed to do that in India, fortunately. But un understandably. <laughs> Was there any uh, the, uh, public sharing resource come out of the outcome of your project? For example, you see, the students you tend to get to a place where they already had some senior peer reviews choose their placement. <coughs> How long will it go by the word of mouth in that sense? So at least you have done a fantastic in grouping the students. They can actually give back the, their, their experiences, not just to you in, as a project, but mm -hmm. later on share with other fellow students who might be going in that sense. Oh, definitely. What about such a, 
resources or sharing or, or websites or something? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so all the students that we get now coming to us asking for self-funded placements, I've spoken to a student who went before. Uh, and whenever I go, so I went to UCLan, um, I don't know if that's a, a hush word around here. I went to UCLan um, a few weeks ago and spoke to a group of their students. Um, one of the UCLan students who came last year came with me and he gave his um, experience to them. And that was a lot more important, important for the students than what I said, because essentially they saw me, as a, saw me as a salesman, whereas he was giving his real life um, you know, experience. And it, yeah, we always invite students to come and speak to other students and also when we do any sort of big events with HE or Global Health Exchange we always invite the students along to give their perceptions as well. Um, so they're the ones who for us speak sort of the most honesty. I was to ask about your selection process. In a way sort of two questions rolled into one. How do you handle the selection process? <coughs> Is it just a straight interview or do you work with them as well? And what additional or extra or different criteria are you looking so the, the um, initially they had to write a, a written application, and so we judged that based on whether they'd done any sort of background research. You can usually tell when you start reading, as you'll know when you start reading <laughs> an application form, how much they thought about it. Some of them just wrote things like, I want to you know, get a suntan and stuff like that. Immediately they went in the bin, obviously. Um, any of them that had sort of done some sort of background research, looked at facts and figures about health and uh, social welfare, um, the majority of them, providing they weren't too outrageous, were invited to interview. Um, the interviews consisted of two stages. Um, there was a group interview, so we interviewed the students in groups of between five and eight, five and nine. Um, we gave them sort of scenario-based questions and asked them to chat in a group and come up with some um, sort of key things that they would do in that sort of situation. And then during that, we looked at people who were maybe too overpowering or people who didn't say a word. We sort of took, we scored them slightly less. We looked for people who sort of middle ground, sort of team players, because teamwork is obviously a key attribute you need to have. Um, when you're in sort of a stressful situation like you are in, in, on, on, on these placements. And then the individual interview, and we had to keep them quite short because we had um, sometimes over 100 students to interview in sort of two days. So it would five, ten minutes, um, a few questions about them, about why they wanted to do the placements, what they thought they could learn. Um, we also wanted to pick the students who weren't just saying, you know, I, I want to go and give my skills, I want to give this, give that. Um, we were looking for the students who took a step back and thought, well, I could really learn this from these people because they know how, you know, they, they'll know how to work with low resources or um, work with these different patient cases. So we looked for students who, again, done, done a bit of background thinking. And then, I guess one of the things that dictated a lot of what we were trying to do was that we tried to get a representative sample from the NHS, which was very, very difficult, because we can only deal with what students we had to apply. So um, we really struggled to gain male applicants. Something like 95% of our students have all been female. Um, that's because a lot of them have been nursing and midwifery. So actually, really no, we've had uh, four or five male students, which is disappointing, but. Can I ask this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you about, um, you sort of mentioned about the liveliness of the, the girls together, um, but I was just wondering if there were any other kind of issues, were there any students who felt that they got there and their expectations were out of kilter and they wanted to go home or any disciplinary procedures? We never followed any formal disciplinary procedures, but we did warn the students and you won't, you're probably not surprised. The thing we had to warn about, warn about with alcohol, because um, Uganda, by and large, and the same with India, well, definitely Bangalore, the students were relatively safe. And so, you know, I, I go out there at night when I'm there. I go out for a restaurant, I go for a beer or something in a restaurant or in, in a bar after. And it is safe to do that, and we tell them that. But some of them, especially the younger ones, um, they were seeing it more as a holiday. They would go, they would drink themselves until they were incapacitated. Uh, and our project manager, Alan, had to go out on a, on a few nights and literally carry them home. And that is putting yourself at far too much risk for us as an organisation. And so that's yeah. the only real thing that we had to discipline students for. By and large, the students turned up on time. They were they behaved well. They behaved professionally. They were polite. They input and they learned. So by and large, no, we were fine. The one thing was alcohol. Um, I'm really surprised at that. I don't know. I think it's just 
It's group, yeah. group mentality, also because yeah. it's quite hard, it's quite strange. Like, yeah. you, you look at it as a way of building relationships with your colleagues. You know? yeah. So it's kind of you're away in a strange place, build relationships, and that's just a social yeah. lubricant that they use. Yeah. I think so, but I, I don't know. Let's go I think it's holiday that. mentality as much as anything. <laughs> yeah. We do. We did. We covered it, though. Don't we do the deal of alcohol? We do now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. okay. We definitely don't. Right. We, to be honest, we didn't really foresee it as being a big issue because we thought the students would be a bit scared of going out. But no, no, they they were out every <laughs> every weekend. Students are very arrogant. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> but to be, to be fair to them, we did tell them that whilst they're on placement, they're on placement. Evenings and weekends are their free time, right, okay. and we were quite, you know, uh, strict on that. We said, you know, go out and enjoy the, the town and, and on the weekend. Go on safaris, go out for a, for a drink, but we didn't expect them to, especially the women, um, to to go out and literally drink themselves till they couldn't stand, and they were getting a lot of attention from local guys and stuff. So, um, it's that's that's that you just, you just naturally gain a lot of attention, even if you're not drinking too much. So, um. well, that's also part of the experience, the learning experience. I mean, it's part of the community. You recognise. Yeah, but it's also about building trust, you know, what people feel comfortable with. I don't know what you mean. Well, people feel comfortable to come to you. There's a lot of culture in, in there's a big culture in developing nations about you go to see a doctor to die, not to get treated, to get better. Yeah. There's a huge build of trust, and you're only there for four weeks. So it's a great I don't understand what you mean. I don't understand why drinking comes into that. Sorry, I'm not following. You're out in the community, whether you're drinking or not, and acting with the community, as a community, in a, in a bar or whatever. You build Acting up. with them as in like, doing what they do? It's about taking the coat off. And oh, right, okay. yourself as, a, a, you as an approachable person to come with problems, rather than just to go to someone else. I don't know if someone, I'd want someone to treat me at the end of my life who can't stand up in a bar. <laughs> so that's where I'm but, <laughs> but, in a, but in a small community, you do not have any yeah. choice. No. You know? I mean, I went to Kananara. You don't, you don't know where that is. Don't worry, you don't need to. Uh, the population of Kananara was 150 people. You see them and they see you in every walk of life. Okay. It, yeah. might, it might be slightly different though because these placement locations that we used, they weren't that rural. I mean, Fort Porter has got a population of... I mean, the, the actual town's got a population of about 200,000 or something. Mm. Oh, but then oh, the, oh, the catchment the area is bigger. Like a lot bigger. Area is quite huge. Oh, the catchment is a lot bigger. Because we flew. But um, obviously you didn't see the people on the properties, right. but if they saw you in the community, it's so much different. We were actually yeah. encouraged to do that. Well, we do. We do encourage them to go out definitely. Uh, and there's a big. That's it. There's a, there's a line, isn't there? And if they're going out and having a drink and having a dance with the locals, that's absolutely fine. But with they them. need that line anyway. Even here, they, they need that line. Oh yeah. They're, they're going to have to. You wouldn't do it in the UK. The way they behaved, you wouldn't act like that in the UK. Some of them. So we did have to walk. It's like Lord of the Flies, medical students. <laughs> yeah. 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 But no, yeah. other than that, they're they, they made. And so your uh, program, uh, the research, makes me think of another uh, topic about the service learning. Uh, I know that a service learning, uh, you already used to in the uh, educational uh, research board area. Sometimes, for so example, some country they use a lot because they hold the students not just to learn something in the class, we also can just to use the community or the local area to learn more. So just like Lira mentioned, who knows that? So that also means so we can learn the knowledge, not just uh, in the class. So I'm also wondering, uh, like service learning sometimes just used in, in, a, in a country or a nation, I mean, that is just to serve the for the people, the, the, the local people. But uh, what do you have mentioned for the medical treatment or the, uh, the placement that is also across the boundary of the nation? So you think that is also a kind of a service learning because the students, uh, they also can develop a lot of abilities like the commitment to the cause. Definitely, yeah, yeah. So by service learning, you mean actually learning about services 
in communities and stuff rather than d right, the patients yeah. yes. themselves. Yes, you're just uh, the local area, the mm. community. Definitely. I mean, yeah. even if you weren't on a placement, if you went to, I guess if you go anywhere in the world and you're not used to it, you do learn subconsciously about the place. You learn about the people, uh, how their actions lead to their, their, their cases, their complications, their illnesses and stuff. So they definitely learn a lot in that way. I don't, I don't know if I completely understand the question. So, so. Um, my question is, uh, uh, <coughs> kind of, uh, the medical placement in another country is also a kind of service learning. Okay. Um, so learning about the services in that country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, so I, I think that it's not just the, the kind of uh, national horizon that is international because that is uh, across another country, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. So you mean sort of health is becoming more global, yeah. and there's more people like living in the UK from these countries mm -hmm. that have um, potentially got similar backgrounds, similar patient case um, background stuff. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, I think a lot. Yeah, I do think most of the learning is is transferable between countries. In fact, 100 percent, I would say. Um, it's interesting, really. A lot of the students who work in certain areas of the country. They fed back to us that they'd never worked with sort of Indian people before, and that sounded crazy to me being from Manchester, because um, there's Indian people, there's people from all over the world in Manchester, but in certain areas, I think in Ormskirk, they said that they never worked with Indian Indian patients, and so them actually working with Indian patients in India and seeing how the families come into the hospitals and treat the patients and look after them, not treat them, sorry, look after them and do the bedding and stuff, that was very interesting for them, and I think that gave them an appreciation when they came back to the UK of how of what the family's role can be in looking after patients. Um, other examples would be I don't know, conditions such as HIV and um, t TB. Although they're rare here, it doesn't mean you can't find them. Um, things like female genital mutilation, although that's uncommon in Uganda, there's more in Uganda than there is here, and students did experience that as well. So. Do you do not have, like in these countries, you do not have continual four week monitoring. You know, you could, in that, it's a pretty less sharp learning curve that you learn. Yeah. And you learn not to be afraid of it, which a lot of us do, you know, not to be afraid of it. I think that's what a lot of, I think that's like what you said, I think that's what a lot of students are looking for. They're looking for these different conditions that they don't see as often in the UK. And so I guess that goes back to the ethical question I asked at the start, is it ethical to go to these countries just to see these yeah. patients with these um, conditions? Well, I mean, if you're improving the outcomes for the, the patients in some way, shape or form, and you're improving the system, i.e. making the system um, more, more able to deal with these patients in the future, and it has to be sustainable, of course, then I would argue that that would be ethical. Um, so it's ethical where there's a longer term goal, like the one you went for? Definitely, yeah. I, I wouldn't agree, as I said at the start, we've never agreed with um, people sort of doing labour substitutions, so coming along and taking a local person's job, working on their own, on a rotor, and treating patients, because although um, the patients are better off as a result, there's no long-term impact left there, and it, it, sadly it's happened to a lot of our medical volunteers that we've had. There was a girl who left recently, she spent 12 months in Uganda and all along we said to her, look, stop, don't stop being on the rotor. Make yourself um, an extra pair of hands, but working with a local person. And she didn't listen to us and then she left and she was really upset at the end. She said, look, I think next week when I leave, everything's going to be back to the way it was. And it was, because she'd left no sort of long-term mm. impact, she'd left nothing behind. Um, it really has to be, you know, you can put your finger in the dike and everything will seem all right, but as soon as you leave, it's, it's still there. And so, um, yeah, I think sort of not not my <coughs> reservation, but what you kind of what you worry is that students go to see to feel better about the UK or something like <coughs> that. I find that a bit like you know uncomfortable. That all we've seen how bad it can be, therefore, and I don't know how ethical I find that. Um, or yeah, trying to I don't know. I don't know, Kirsty. I think it's extremely open. I just think universal healthcare is extremely important to defend. I think that we, as a community, doctors can get pretty apathetic about what the risks yeah. are, and if if we all we all pledge to do no harm, <coughs> and universal health care is an extremely important part of, of that ideology. That's important part of their education to promote. 
Yeah, if they're aware that that's what it is, but I think... Without that exposure, they're not aware. But I think we can still have that exposure and not be quite 100% clear that that's what, you know, that you're seeing it beyond just, well, at least my, my patch is actually all right that I've composed it. Do you know what I mean? So seeing it in the bigger picture terms... It's like to protecting my patch. I know, but I don't know. I, just, I, I don't know. I'm probably a bit alone here. I think, I think we're trying... <laughs> I think I think we're trying to not not make them think oh well that's that place is rubbish we are very you know we are fine I think we're trying to get them to go there and contribute uh, feel feel like they're contributing to our projects which are making a difference I think they are making a difference yeah. our our sort of long term projects so if the students can go and link into those projects and, and genuinely make a difference and then go back and yes they might think well you know that like, Uganda hospital was horrible but nothing much we can do about that as such. Um, yeah, we're trying think, our best to make yeah, sustainable Yeah, no, and I get that, and, and I think that, that long-term thing is, is a huge asset of, yeah. of the ethical dimension of it. I think what I meant was, you know, what do students take from it? It's because it's like, I'm all right, Jack, kind of thing, which I'm sure is not what they're saying, but it's trying to make them locate that in that bigger universal healthcare thing. One of the, one of the biggest problems we... Sorry? Period of skills. <coughs> No, we're just just to see the bigger picture rather than just think, well, I've seen how bad it can be, and then I feel better about my patients at home, you know. And, and I think that's obviously something that's going to happen, but it's then making that like extrapolating that up into being a bigger message. I don't know. I don't one know of the things we <laughs> one of the really interesting things that um, what you're saying has led us to think to think about actually is um, culture relates to cultural awareness. Now, if a student goes on placement and they come back saying they are more culturally aware. Are they really more culturally aware? Do they understand the culture? And that goes back to what I was saying about a student spending one day in a place. Now, you can't learn about the culture of a place in a day. You can't learn about it in four weeks. And yet the students come back saying, oh well, you know, their culture is, is terrible. They don't care about death. They don't, they don't show any sort of respect to parents. I wouldn't say that was cultural awareness. That's not, that's, that's, not understanding the background to something and so that, that's what we're trying to build into our induction now um, teaching them more about culture and how you thinking you knowing about someone's culture isn't actually you knowing about their culture it's, it's your perspective on their culture, the difference between your own culture yeah, yeah. Uh, and the students don't always realize you know these staff work 12 hour days they might not have been paid in six months so if they sneak off from work at one o'clock to go do the gardening at their parents house or something you can understand that <laughs> but the students don't see it that way and that's something that we have to be very careful in some ways it's almost sort of racist you know, a student coming back and saying oh well they don't care yeah. they they have bad practice they I think, um, yeah I think that's what I meant with it's, I'm quite like Ooh, I think it was a quote about not offering any compassion during the yeah is it the childbirth or yeah, which I think actually you could that. look you could look back. My mum always tells the story about having me and the fact that she had no, uh, you know, that the, the midwives were terrible with it. But I think it is cultural. It's and it's and it's, <coughs> it's about time and generations and all these other things. And yeah. Yeah. So I think I found that quote quite uncomfortable to read. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I understand. And we do do. We try to do more work with the students now to prepare them and so to to teach them, you know, just because you see something, that doesn't mean that's necessarily cultural, it might just be because, you know, there's a lot of background factors behind why things are how they are. Yeah. Uh, so if you see something on face value, i.e. A, a member of staff leaving work early or, um, you know, a member of staff not, not grieving with the family, it's not necessarily because the person doesn't care. Yeah. Uh, so it's not necessarily a cultural issue, it might, it might be a cultural issue in, in that death's not regarded as importantly as it is here. But, um, it might also be because they've been working for 12 hours solid and they're absolutely knackered and want to go home or... Um. <coughs> right, 12, hour, 12 hour shifts and working and not getting paid for a long time. That's really interesting. Oh, is it 2 o'clock? Have we got Yeah. Okay, well, we'll, yeah, we'll leave it there. We've grilled you for like 45 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll give you another little clap. No problem.